morning. I would think by now you know to have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look this morning at fasting. And um, I got to tell you, I, I was sitting here singing. Jesse's uh, song choice and song leading helped uh, a little, especially that last one, to get me in the frame for talking about fasting. But my mood right now does not fit the lesson. Um, and my, um, I, I would just say this. If you are a parent with a kid in the middle school class or the high school class, please would you do me this favor. Ask your student, your kid, after services today to take out their Bible and to preach you a lesson. It is, I asked Jake, I'll share pictures, but I asked Jake, I felt like my heart was going to explode in Bible class this morning because um, at one point, point I looked out and every single one of the kids was down writing and doing all of this stuff and you can see it too and and our Sunday night lessons going through the books and to see a group of young people engaged in the text is just so encouraging and um, it's it's hard to come into the subject of fasting knowing what I'm going to talk about this morning feeling so encouraged and happy these don't match they don't go together um, so there's, there's that. Um, anyway, uh, we started with Matthew chapter six and verse one. This is the main theme. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your father who is in heaven. That's going to mean a lot for us at the end of this lesson today. Um, but if you go through, Jesus gave three illustrations. He said, when you give, don't do it to be seen. When you pray, don't do it to be seen. And then this is our text for today. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. There's the problem. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others. Uh, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a couple of things that I will need you to see in this passage right here. It's behind me on the board right now. And that is that Jesus said to his disciples, when you fast. He said it twice. Look at verse 16. When you fast, do not look gloomy. And then in verse 17, when you fast, this is how you do it. And one of the things that immediately just pops up in my brain uh, as you start to talk about this subject is that, at least for me, I, I don't, I try not to throw my own situation and my own feelings on anybody else whenever I talk about this stuff, but I would assume we're probably a lot in the same boat here. This is just one of those things that's not a regular part of our Christianity. It's... It's almost foreign and alien and strange to talk about fasting in, in our world today. Uh, I will tell you even that there have been conversations, you know, I've had these conversations with people in the past who talk about, well, that's an Old Testament thing. It's like sacrifices, like the feast and the, the festivals and the celebrations and the Sabbath. That's Old Testament stuff. That's not a New Testament thing which is completely wrong-headed. That's not anywhere close to even what the Bible teaches. In fact, you can turn here if you want. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14 and 15 teaches us exactly the opposite of that. In verse 14, the disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, came to Jesus saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast? Old Testament people doing Old Testament things. We and the Pharisees fast, but Jesus, you and your disciples, you don't fast. And Jesus said, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Jesus basically says, why would they fast? I'm the son of God present in your midst. Why would you fast and mourn over me being here right now? Uh, I'm in your midst, but listen to what he says. He says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, I take that to mean that Jesus was 
crucified and, and buried and raised from the dead, but then ascended into heaven. And he's no longer here immediately in our, in our midst right now. And Jesus says, and then they will fast. That's us right now, not in the literal actual presence of Jesus. And Jesus says, here is a time uh, for fasting. And so fasting is, is in fact, um, a New Testament thing. You see it. We'll see several of these things. And I should probably give you a heads up. Um, partly because I don't want to take away from the message of this morning, but partly because there really is a lot. There's two aspects of fasting that I want to talk about with this. And so we're going to do two lessons this morning and next Sunday morning. So uh, probably more next Sunday morning. We're going to see in the New Testament, lots of Christians fasted for different reasons. Uh, things that we should probably be paying attention to and taking note of if we want to follow the New Testament model of Christianity. I will say this one last thing. Um, I, I, I looked at an article to prepare for this. It's um, Ken Bergui, A Biblical Perspective on Fasting. And I, I, it's really important to note that he wrote this article in 2001. You can see the date. And this is the sentence that opens up the article. In a culture where the landscape is dotted with shrines to the golden arches and an assortment of pizza temples, fasting seems out of place, out of step with the times. In fact, fasting has been in general disrepute both in and outside the church for many years. For example, in my research, I could not find a single book published on the subject of Christian fasting from 1861 to 1954, a period of nearly 100 years. That was in 2001. I'm hopeful for this conversation because that's not really true anymore. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a, um, a crazy health and fitness guy. And I would say probably I know some of you are not either. But fasting is, is a part of some of our conversations. Like in 2001... It used to not be a part of our vocabulary. Now it is. Like people talk about intermittent fasting all the time. It's a thing that is, is actually something that uh, is within our realm of conversation these days. This is a, a chart from the Google Ingram viewer where you can say, okay, Google, Google has scanned all of these books. And what you can do is you can say, um, show me trends of words that have been used through the years in all of the books that you have, Google. And so here's the word fasting. This is 1800. You can see from like 1800 to the 18, through the, through the Great Depression, basically. Um, th fasting was a more prominent topic. Uh, uh, I, guess, I guess I'm 100 years off. But still, uh, I'm... I'm Pretty sure, you know, food is not just as readily available. You see this decline, though, in, in fasting. Um, we're going to go downhill. And so basically for this period of time, I mean, there is not a lot of conversation about fasting happening. This line is just before 2000. So this is the last 20 years. And what the trend shows you is the conversation is more prominent with the word fasting in the last 20 years. Uh, since this article has been written. And so I think, you know, I'm not just trying to be overly optimistic about this, but I think we're in a good place to have this conversation right now. It's a good time to be talking about what the Bible teaches uh, because this is something that may already be a part of your lives in practice, or at least it's not weird uh, in that way. I'm going to throw up several passages here in the Bible to just talk about um, this uh, number one, top of the list. This is the most prominent reason for fasting in all the Bible. And I can share a list. I have a list uh, that, I, that I've printed out with all the times fasting is listed in the Bible. I'm happy to share that with you if you want. You go through that list. I think there's something like 60, 59 different contexts in the Bible where that, that, um, that is something that we need to talk about here. Um, if you read through all of the 59 examples, 
Fasting as a natural response to sorrow is by far the number one reason for fasting in the Bible. And these first examples that I have on the board for you right now, listen, I don't, I don't think I probably even need to have a Bible verse for you, let alone as many as I'm going to flash up on the board for you right now, because this is something that either you know or you don't know. Um, and, and, and it's just basically this. Have you ever been so stressed out or so sad or so miserable that you just didn't feel like eating? And so you were sitting there and you're like, oh, no, I've never felt like that. Then you, you, then you don't know because we all have a place. Um, and, and sometimes this is like, sometimes this is the death of a family member. I mean, we're talking about I am in the pit right now. It could be a job situation, right? It could be anything, but this is, let's look at some of these examples. You'll see Hannah, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 5. Uh, to Hannah, uh, her husband gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. This is his, Elkanah's other wife. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? This is not... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these examples. This is an illustration of, of this emotion right now. This is not what I'm going to throw into the category of biblical fasting. Even though it's in the biblical. It's not what... We're talking about right now. This is just a, a story about a human who's experiencing human stuff. She wants to have a kid. She can't have a kid. And in her circumstances right now, here is her husband's other wife who can have a kid. And he's provoking her and irritating her and making fun of her. Making all of her sorrow and emotions even worse. And the emotion is, I'm crying and I just don't want to eat right now. you got to get the emotion. If you don't have the emotion, then you're not going to be able to do what this lesson is intended to do. In 1 Kings chapter 21, this is a, this is a bad illustration of this, I think. Nevertheless, it's an illustration. Do you remember when Ahab tried to uh, get the field from Naboth? And Naboth said, no, you can't. This is my family field. It's not right for me to do this. Uh, and Ahab pouted about it. Ahab went into his house, vexed and sullen, because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And this is Ahab's response. He lay down on his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no food. Wham. You, you poor little baby. But he is just so upset. He is so at the end of his emotional rope right now that he says, I can't, I just, I, can't, I don't want to even eat. I don't want any food. In Job chapter 3 and verse 24, this has been kind of fun in this study to go through different versions of the Bible to see how they are conveying this emotion. Job 3, 24 in the ESV, my sighing comes instead of my bread. The New American Standard, my groaning comes at the sigh of my food. And so that one gives you the picture of something like somebody puts food in front of you and you go, <sighs> NIV, sighing has become my daily food. Instead of eating, I sigh and I groan. And then the NET, I like this one the best. It, it gets what I think is the most real in the gut uh, for my sighing comes in place of my food. I don't want to eat. I'm so sad right now. And you know Job's circumstances. This is right at the beginning. Psalm 42 in verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night in the ESV. In the NET, it says, I cannot eat. I weep day and night. This is not biblical fasting in the sense of being connected with God and religion. This is just what you already know. I, I don't think Probably I need to read verses to show you this. My heart is struck down like grass and is withered. I forget to eat my bread. 
just can't, I don't, I don't want to eat right now. I think there's one more. This is probably the last one. Psalm 107, verse 17, some were fools through their sinful ways and because of their iniquity suffered affliction and then the different versions in verse 18. They loathed any kind of food um, or the NET. They lost their appetite for all food. That's, that's, that's the idea. That's what we're talking about here. So this emotion. Number one, listen, this lesson is not going to work if you don't have this emotion in the front of your brain. And it might be best if you just try to recall, you know, that one or two times in your life where it has happened and to remember how sad you were and what it felt like. If you don't have this emotion in your head, this lesson isn't going to work. Not going to make any sense. Let's take the emotion. I am so sad that I don't even want to eat right now. Let's take that emotion. Step two for us is going to be, now let's connect it to God. This is where we're going to move into what I'm going to call biblical fasting or religious fasting. This, I am so sad that I don't want to eat. And it's somehow tied and tethered to God and what I'm dealing with with God and how I'm communicating with God throughout this time of sorrow. 2 Samuel chapter 12 is following David's sin with Bathsheba and the consequence of that sin was God said to David, your child is going to die. So imagine you're in that situation. Not only, not only are you going to lose your child, you are responsible. This is happening and the child is going to die because of something that you did. Imagine where you are emotionally in that time. And that brings us to 2 Samuel 12, verses 15 and 17. The Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David therefore sought God on behalf of the child. You should be able to sympathize with this one. I'm going to pray as hard as I know how and as long as I need to on behalf of my kid. Please do not let my kid die. So David sought God on behalf of his child. David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. And the elders of the house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. This is not just some sort of religious action or some sort of religious behavior. It is in combination with how he feels and why he feels it right now. And so the idea is I'm sick and I can't eat. I don't want to eat. But the biblical religious aspect of this is I'm going to spend this time and while I live in this emotion connecting with God and praying with God and seeking God on behalf of this child. That's the religious element that you see here. I'm going to go to another one with Ahab because even though Ahab is, I mean, one of the worst characters in all of the Bible. He still repented. In 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 27, when Ahab heard the words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his flesh, and he fasted, and he lay in sackcloth and went about dejectedly. So he's sad, and he's not eating. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying... Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? That's one of the things from this text that I really need you to pay attention to. It's not, it's not just emotion. It's not just the feeling of I'm so sick that I don't want to eat. This is a total and complete humbling of myself and throwing myself at God's feet to say, I have nothing else right now. There's nothing that I can do. I don't eat, I'm not even eating food right now. But to lay at your feet and beg you for the thing that I'm asking for. And so the, he humbled himself. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring disaster upon um, his house. And so here's the thing that I want us to really focus on. The biblical fasting, the religious fasting is the emotional response. But, but the fasting that we're talking about and connecting it with God, that is a response. That's the key word. 
It's the response to the feeling. It's a reflection of the feeling. It is not an action that we go through as if it is some religious thing that we're supposed to do, like singing. You know, uh, uh, that's a bad example. I know you're going to get on to me for saying that. But sometimes we come here and I don't really feel like it, but I sing because I'm supposed to sing. And that's what we do. And so you say, well, you know, I, I, I don't really feel bad right now. I don't really feel like doing anything. But Jesus said, when you fast, and so I'm not going to eat any food and I'm not going to fast. That's not what we're talking about. It's not a rote action or some sort of mechanical thing that you do. It's a response. And so in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, so much of this has led us to this point. If you consider the Beatitudes... Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what we're talking about with this conversation right now and all of these different things. And I'll say before I start to read this, if you want to turn to Isaiah 58, uh, we're going to read uh, uh, several verses from Isaiah 58 here in just a second. But as I turn there, let me tell you, I think this is what our country needs right now. In the Bible, when you see people in difficult circumstances and in frustrating circumstances, we see um, every kind of immorality in every corner and violence constantly fills up our, our news feed. This is what our country needs, but at least in my opinion, we're not ready for it yet. We're not too fasting yet. Um, we see the immorality and we see the violence and I'm mad enough to write about it on Facebook, but I'm not so upset about it that I can't eat or that I don't even feel like putting food in my, in my mouth. I'm not yet to the point, and I think I can say we, are not yet to the point where we are sick with the sin of the world, where I'm not going to eat and I have nothing but to humble myself and throw myself at God's feet and say, there's nothing, there's nothing left for me right now but to beg you. I think that's where we need to be. I don't think that's where we are. Look at Isaiah 58. Um, I'm going to offer a warning and I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. Uh, uh, before I read verses 1 through 11, I want to make uh, this little disclaimer. This is a warning for you. And it's what I was talking about just a minute ago. If your fasting is just fasting because it's what you think you ought to do, that's, that's not good. That's not what we do. Our fasting is a response, a reflection of the heart. Chapter 58 and verse 1. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Um, here are the people and they're saying, God, show us your ways. God, teach us. God, help us. And what God is saying is, you're asking me these things as if you are a righteous nation. And did not forsake my judgments. They ask me for my righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God in verse 3. What, this is what they say. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? We, we did all the stuff you told us to do, God. And you're not answering. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice heard on high. They're fasting and they're throwing themselves at God's feet as if they are at the end of their emotional rope. And God says, and then you get up from your fast and you fight with each other. And God says, you're not there yet. That's not what we're describing. Is such a fast, I'm in verse 5, is, is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? 
Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? This is what I want from you. This is what God says I want from you. To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? And, and then you shall, I'm sorry, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer and you shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourselves out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted and shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday and the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. When I read this text, what I think of is the time, I would assume most of us have been here, but it's the time where you're at that spot that we've been describing in this lesson and you say to God, I will do anything. Tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it. I'm at the place right now, God, where if you will listen to me, if you will be with my child, if you will be with my marriage, if you will help me with this job situation, I will give you anything. I'll give you my whole self, whatever it is that you want. That's the thing that leads us to the kind of fasting that we read about in the Bible. And what happens in Isaiah chapter 58 is a group of people who say, I'm not going to eat food today and look how religious and cool I am and not change or feel or think any differently about their lives at that moment. That's not it. Look at Joel chapter 2. There's another one that I want to read with you. In Joel chapter 2, this is what God is calling for. Joel chapter 2 in verses 12 through 17. Yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people. Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber between the vestibule and the altar. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? I know that I have no right to, to say anything like this or to make any sorts of predictions or uh, call the future. I have no ability to do it. I have no right to do it. But I read through the scriptures and I see the character of God and his actions over and over and over again. And I have, I have zero doubt in my head that if we on a national scale, all the people who are listed, your, your men, your women, your children, even your nursing infants, your bridegroom, the, the grooms, the brides, the priests, everybody. If we as a nation would come to this spot where we entirely humble ourselves and empty ourselves out and throw, us on the, uh, throw ourselves on the ground at God's feet and say, save us and help us, I have no doubt that he would do it. But we're not there yet. It's the emotion. It's the emotion that makes this fasting 
what it is. And I'll read just one more example because this is, uh, I think, the biblical message. Turn over to Jonah. It's all of Jonah chapter 3, and it's what most of us, I think, whenever we think of Jonah, um, 10 verses, it shouldn't be this long. In verse 1, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Oh, I'm sorry, that was chapter Two, uh, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Three days' journey in breadth. Remember that. So it's three days to get across the city. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. He's 30% done with his work. And at 30%, this is the response. He says, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. And they called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. They didn't want to be destroyed. They heard what Jonah was saying. You're going to be completely destroyed. And the people said, we don't want that. That's, that puts me in the spot of so sad that I don't want to eat food. So they called fast. In verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered his head with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence of which is in his hands. Who knows? There's no presumption here. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, just maybe, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. God responds to total and complete brokenness. And that's what fasting is. I have one more thing that I want to say to you, and then, uh, and then I'll be finished with this. But I, I just want to keep your head here just a second. The fasting that we're talking about is a natural response to deep sorrow. And biblical religious fasting takes that natural response to sorrow and connects it to God. Turn over to Leviticus chapter 16. One thing that is a little shocking to me is that for all the fasting that you hear about and read about in the Bible, so far as I know, always leave the door open to this because there's a tiny little sliver of, of uncertainty in my head with this. So I'll just say as far as I know, I think in the Old Testament, there is only one time where God's people are commanded to fast. Every other time you see fasting in the Bible, it's a response that we've been talking about. But one time in the Old Testament, God says, once a year, you will do this thing. And it's on the Day of Atonement. And it's even a little bit hard to see in Leviticus 16 and verse 29 after the whole... Uh, process of the Day of Atonement is described. In verse 29 he says, this is what you're going to do every year. It shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves. That description, I think the New American Standard says you shall humble yourselves. That description there is why um, so like in Acts 29 when the New Testament refers to the Day of Atonement, it's called the fast. In Acts 29, when you see the fast, it's referring to the Day of Atonement. It's because of this command that God said, On this day you shall afflict yourselves. You shall do no work, either the native or the stranger or the sojourner among you. For on that day you, uh, shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean from the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you. And you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. Every other celebration in the Old Testament is a feast. The feast of Passover. The feast of Pentecost. The feast of trumpets. All of these other things. They're feasts. Not the day when we 
have to pay to get rid of our sins. That's not a day of feasting. That's a day of fasting. It's a day of mourning and sorrow. Ultimately, because the sacrifices that we're going to read about through the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16 point us to the end of the road that we know that it was going to be Jesus, the Son of God, who had to give himself to die on a cross in order to pay for the sin that I committed. I don't celebrate on that day. That's a day where I feel sad because of what I cost God. It's something that we're about to do in just a minute when we eat the Lord's Supper. I realize it's a great paradox. It is a time of celebration because um, what Jesse is about to sing, when I feel that rotten, the natural consequences of sorrow uh, and the sense of guilt for what I have created with my sin, when I feel that rotten and that low that I don't even feel like eating, that's the point where God says to me, all things are ready, come to the feast. Now it's time to celebrate. First, you have to be at the bottom. And that's what the Day of Atonement is all about. Afflict yourselves. And so we're going to sing, all things are ready, come to the feast. The feast is only made possible because of what God did through Jesus in paying the price for our sins. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, and you can appreciate that great price that was paid for you, so that you can be right with God, then uh, if you know what you need to do, now is the time to respond. If you already are a Christian, and for whatever reason you have uh, strayed off the path of Christian living, uh, the Bible calls it walking in darkness, and you feel the weight, uh, the burden of that sin that you have created in your life, and you, you're at the bottom where you say, oh no, this is not good. Then you say, God, will you forgive me and give me another chance? This is when you make it right. If you're ready to respond to this invitation, come forward as together we stand and sing.